and welcome. Um, I think we'll get started. And I'm very, very pleased uh, to uh, introduce our speaker today, Dr. Andreas uh, Neofitu, um, who is an assistant professor of epidemiology in the Department of Environmental and Radiological Health Sciences at Colorado State University. Um, uh, Dr. Neofitu had um, gotten a joint uh, PhD uh, in environmental health and epidemiology from Harvard and did his postdoctoral training at Berkeley. And his uh, research focuses on advanced epidemiologic methods and causal inference in epidemiology as they apply to the areas of environmental and occupational health. And um, I'll leave it there and, and let you start your talk. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. Uh, so like Jill said, I'm going to be talking about causal inference in environmental epidemiology in particular, uh, but also uh, occupational epi as I see it as part of environmental epi. Um, and I'm going to try and uh, outline a framework of how do we go about using observational data in order to answer causal questions. Uh, and obviously, with observational data, we can never uh, be certain of inferring causality, but at least we can lay out the assumptions uh, that would allow us to do so. And in that course, I'm going to show, um, I'm going to talk about how we go about uh, developing questions that are essential essentially assessing hypothetical interventions on exposure. Uh, and I'm going to show two applied examples, one from occupational epi and one from environmental epi. Uh, and in the course of those examples, I'm going to particularly talk about methodological issues that have to do with uh, time variant compounding and also methods to deal with uh, exposure lag response, uh, the question of having a prolonged exposure over a long period of time that could be influential uh, for, for its entire duration. Uh, so, in how do we go about uh, using observational data to help us answer causal questions? When I was a doctoral student, uh, our epi professor, Dr. Hernan, would always try to drive the point of you should analyze your data as if they were from a randomized experiment. Um, so, we formulate a causal question of interest that typically has a hypothetical intervention in mind. So in environmental epidemiology, that would usually be some kind of policy change uh, or um, uh, regulation to deal with some kind of environmental exposure. And then once we have that uh, question in mind, we specify a target parameter of interest that answers that particular question. So if we have an air pollution study and we wanna know what the reduction in risk would be if exposure levels we're always in compliance with EPA standards. That's a hypothetical because exposures are not always in compliance. Uh, once we have that, the target parameter of interest would be a risk ratio or a risk difference comparing the exposure scenario that is comp in compliance to the observed that is not. Uh, and then we would estimate reduction in risk. Um, and I say risk here, I mean uh, the actual parameter of risk, so the probability of actually developing the outcome versus not. Uh, and that's, uh, that's going to be a focus on both of the examples uh, I present, rather than, say, the author that has a ratio, uh, because, A, it's much more easy uh, to uh, translate that uh, into policy, but also communicate that to the public. Uh, we can estimate things like numbers of cases eliminated, which is in itself much more easy to interpret rather than the hazard ratio or the off ratio or some of the other parameters. So I'm going to try and uh, get to an answer that has to do with risk in both of those examples. Uh, so again, we have observational data. We don't have a randomized experiment, even though we're trying to analyze it as if we have. Uh, what we want to ask ourselves is, is this target parameter of interest that we have in mind identifiable from the observed data? Uh, and then we're going to have some assumed data generating mechanism that gave rise to the observed data and also the assumptions that need to hold in order for us to interpret whatever associations we generate from the, those data as, in fact, causal. Um, and once we have those assumptions in place, we specify an estimating approach because depending on those assumptions, some approaches may be uh, more um, appropriate than others. So my first example is going to be for, uh, from occupational epidemiology. Uh, it sort of lends itself to starting more uh, easily than the second one. Uh, 
uh, and it's specifically about silica exposure in the diatomaceous earth industry. Uh, and silica is, uh, as you see it on the, um, on the right, it's like uh, that sediment rock comes from those uh, craters on the left, which are diatoms, and essentially the exoskeletons of these microorganisms become sedimented in, in, uh, in the rock and they are excavated or mined. Uh, and then they're turned into very fine powder that has many, many, many uses. And that's just silica dust right there. Uh, and some examples are uh, bricks for construction industry. It's used in pesticide and insecticides. Uh, it's part of uh, kill litter. Uh, it's actually a mild stabilizing agent in dynamite. And it's also in toothpaste. So it's very, very abundant. Uh, and it's because of this uh, multiple uses that it's somewhat of a dangerous exposure uh, and also ubiquitous in its nature as educational exposure. So these are two examples of uh, people, I think both of these are from the construction uh, industry and they're using some kind of uh, form of protection. The person on the left is actually spraying the granite that they're cutting um, with water to limit the, the dust exposure and granite can, uh, contains silica person on the left doing the same with a brick and they're wearing a personal respirator mask. Uh, and these people are both uh, under the purview of OSHA. And OSHA recently, I think in 2016, uh, came out with a silica rule that limits uh, occupational exposure to silica at 50 micrograms per meter cube. Uh, my example it was uh, from the Dynamics Earth Industry, which is a mining process. So they're under the purview of MSHA the Mining Safety and Health Administration. And they, uh, in contrast to OSHA, do not have a clear silica policy. Uh, they uh, have regulation that limits exposure to crystalline silica as it itself is measured in samples of respirable dust. And uh, the way that they're com uh, coming up with their uh, limits are based on 1973 American College terms of uh, governmental and industrial hygiene is uh, threshold limit values for a various uh, variety of uh, uh, contaminants and chemicals. So in contrast to OSHA, MSHA is using regulation from 1973. Uh, so we're trying to come up with a question of interest, some kind of uh, policy change or intervention of interest. Uh, and MSHA is actually uh, identifying it itself. This is uh, a statement of need that they published soon after OSHA came up with their own silica rule. And they're accepting the fact that their own standards are outdated. Uh, they're not, may not be fully protected workers and they tend to use OSHA work, but also other uh, literature and risk assessment to come up with their own um, standards. So what we decided to do is analyze the observational data with, that we had with the question of what would the effect of an intervention on silica exposure would have been in this particular cohort. So this cohort is actually followed even from before MSHA enacted their own outdated standards. So for a good chunk of it, it was not uh, under any regulation at all. We want to know what the reduction in risk of uh, mortality would have been if there had been regulation. So that's our hypothetical exposure, going back in time and enacting uh, some kind of uh, regulation. And we're going to use uh, the 50 microgram per meter cube uh, standard that OSHA is currently using as our uh, own limit, but also always unexposed. Uh, always unexposed has a limitation in the fact that it cannot be considered attainable, especially in an industry like the Dynamashes Earth. There's always going to be some kind of silica exposure. You can't get down to zero. But we're going to try and extrapolate uh, from our estimation approach to see what it would have been, because that allows us to get at the pre-war fashions. If we completely remove the exposure, then we know what the attributable risk of the exposure is. Uh, and then we're going to estimate risk of uh, specifically lung cancer and non-malignant respiratory disease mortality, which are both uh, causes of death that are uh, strongly linked with uh, silica exposure under both those influences. Uh, the study population was uh, Harvey Chekaway's uh, California Dynamashes Earth Workers cohort, for those of you that are maybe familiar with it. Uh, briefly, it's uh, 2,342 
white male workers followed for mortality for about 70 years. Uh, and the main inclusion criterion was that they had at least one year of cumulative employment at the participating uh, mines. Uh, this is the observed exposures. This is just the density plot. And the vertical line at 50 is where the limit, uh, our hypothetical limit, uh, would have been. And you see there's quite a bit of the exposure distribution that's above that. Uh, the big spike is actually below that, so that wouldn't necessarily change under, under our hypothetical intervention, but everything that's above that limit, we would bring down to 50. Um, and the main methodological issue for this example is the healthy worker survivor effect, or timeline and confounding effect of previous exposure, as I'm going to try and describe. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with this, uh, is that as exposure may lead less individuals, uh, less healthy individuals to terminate their employment earlier than the more healthy individuals, uh, the more healthy individuals will accumulate more exposure, but are also less prone to health outcomes, whereas the less healthy individuals have less exposure, are more prone to health outcomes, and that makes it look like the exposure is protected, even though it's not. Um, and again, as I've said, this is uh, an example of time very confounding affected by previous exposure. Uh, the problem with this is that a standard regression approach cannot <laughs> deal with this. We need to use uh, more advanced methodology. And this is a directly cyclic graph trying to uh, describe um, the problem. So I have E as the exposure of interest, Y is the outcome, W is being actively employed, and there's some unmeasured common cause of both being actively employed and developing the outcome of interest. So that could be underlying health status, that could be genetics, anything. Um, so at time point K plus one, someone who is actively employed will be exposed. You have to be actively exposed in occupational epidemiology examples to be exposed. But uh, being actively employed at K plus one is dependent on your exposure. So if you're more sensitive to the exposure of interest, if it's an irritant or uh, it's causing subclinical um, health conditions, then being exposed earlier will lead you to leave work. So that's why we have the arrow from exposure going into employment status. Uh, the effect of interest is the one that you see here uh, in the dotted arrows. So it's anything that leaves the exposure and ends up at the outcome. As long as it's a forward moving uh, uh, path following those arrows from the exposure to the outcome, it's part of the effect of interest. Um, so we have confounding bias though, and that's shown by those dotted arrows. So we want to remove that confounding bias in order to be able to identify the effect of interest. So typically what we do to deal with confounding is we control for the confounder in a regression. If we do that in this case, and we depict, depict uh, controlling uh, in either regression or stratifying with, by putting a box about the variable of interest, uh, we're blocking that confounding pathway, but what this does is uh, induce what is called collider bias. And that's when two arrows meet at the same variable and you control for that variable. So that opens what used to be a closed path between employment, uh, between exposure, employment status, and the unmeasured confounder going to the outcome. So by trying to deal with confounding, we're inducing a, a different kind of bias, which now is also uh, affecting our ability to identify the effect of interest. Uh, and that's why we cannot use traditional regression approaches to deal with this issue. But what we can use is one of a collection of methods that are called key methods, uh, and they are equipped to address with uh, an issue such as time varying compounding affected by, by uh, previous exposure. Uh, and in particular, in this example, um, I'm going to be using the parametric G formula, which is an extension of standardization in longitudinal setting. So let's assume that we have uh, uh, <coughs> of interest about smoking causing cancer, and we're concerned about confounding by sex, we just take some kind of uh, weighted average of the probability of uh, the outcome given exposure within strata of uh, the confounder. So we're taking this and we're 
bringing it to uh, a time varying uh, setting with multiple concurrent and time points. Uh, so this is a little too technical, uh, but I'm going to try and grab it. Uh, we're going to estimate the overall expectation of an outcome as a weighted sum, uh, similar to that simple example with uh, smoking cancer, of conditional expectations of the outcome over exposure and covariant histories. Uh, and the way we do this is we fit separate models for the outcome, any competing risks, and time varying uh, confounders, including uh, time varying exposure, and use a Monte Carlo estimator to approximate the integral or the weighted sum of the uh, uh, um, and exposure histories. And then we boost up the entire thing to get our 95% uh, confidence intervals. Uh, so as a quantity is actually quite complicated, so that's the simple example with one confounder exposure and outcome. What we estimated in this particular example is this. Uh, so it gets, the more confounders you have, the more time points you have, it gets more and more complicated. I'm not going to go through that, I just wanted to show that it, it can become more complicated. Uh, so I'm going to jump straight into results. So this is the table for lung cancer mortality. Uh, and the first line is what actually happened. So at age 90, the cumulative incidence or cumulative risk uh, in this cohort uh, for lung cancer mortality was 7.2%. And then we went and predicted what the risk would have been under those two interventions. And it drops to 6.2 for a limit of 50 micrograms. And it drops a little further to 5.9 uh, if we completely remove the exposure. And then using those risk estimates from the first column, we can actually uh, um, construct risk ratios and risk differences. And these are the ones. Um, you can see that our interventions are protective but they're not statistically significant. Uh, it's a relatively small cohort, so I think it's mostly due to sample size. Uh, there, is, there should have been a true protective effect. We know that silica is uh, an identified known carcinogen, so I think the, the lack of statistical significance is due to the small sample size. Um, same picture for non-malignant respiratory disease. Now you do see statistical significance. We had a lot more cases, but also the effect is uh, larger. Uh, quite protective interventions where if we focus on that risk ratio right there, that basically tells us that if we remove the exposure, we're removing 40% of the risk, approximately 40% of the risk. Uh, and again, the reason that we did uh, always unexposed or completely removing the exposure is to get attributable fractions. Um, and for lung cancer, it was 18%, and for non molecular respiratory disease, it was 39%, which is very, very high. Um, the other cool thing about this method is that we can construct cumulative instance graphs. So this is the actual uh, probability of developing the outcome as people age. Um, and then on the left, you see uh, lung cancer mortality, on the right, non molecular respiratory disease. And the solid black line is what actually happened, and the two dotted lines are the interventions. Uh, and then you see the reduction in cumulative incidence for each intervention and for each outcome. Um, another good thing about the method is that um, it allows us to estimate what are subdistribution cumulative incidence estimates. And what that essentially does is that, say we start with this number of lung cancer uh, um, deaths on the with the blue circles on the left and the red circles on the right are the non malignant respiratory disease deaths. If we go in and intervene and prevent some of those deaths, let's assume that we're preventing two of the lung cancer deaths and we're preventing five of the NMRD deaths. One of those people that didn't die of lung cancer, that would have died of lung cancer, may end up dying of non malignant respiratory disease. So we're actually accounting for that. So that's all accounted for here. Um, and in summary, uh, how to interpret these findings? Um, the famous Benzing Supreme, case, uh, Supreme Court case, uh, somewhere in, uh, in the judge's verdict, it was stated that one excess death in 1,000 people is identified as significant risk. Uh, so in this case, uh, the hypothetical limit of 50 microgram removes most of the observed risk for both lung cancer and non-medical respiratory disease. But that remainder 
so the difference between the 50 and the always on its rows, that is still above one, the excess that in 1,000. So what that tells us is that 50 microgram uh, per meter cube uh, limit may be removing most of the risk, but it's not necessarily a safe limit. It does not remove all risk. Uh, so I'm going to jump to, uh, oh, for just a quick note, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the way that NIOSH does um, risk assessment. They typically assume like a hypothetical limit just like we did in this project, uh, but they're, they're assuming that workers are exposed to the given exposure for eight hour uh, time-weighted average uh, periods over 40 hour, hour work weeks over 45 year work life. So that basically means that everyone's going to be exposed for 45 years or until they die. Uh, we didn't do this, even though we would like to have something that uh, can be comparable to NIOSH risk assessment. And the reason we didn't do this is because this actually assumes that we're intervening on employment status. So we're forcing everyone to be employed for 45 years. Uh, so we didn't do that because we don't think that part of the effect of W going to Y to K plus one, that's not identifiable because of that omega or uh, U over there. Uh, we think that the estimates that we did under the assumptions of uh, other known measure confounding is identifiable, but the way that managed by did we do not do in this uh, example. Uh, so now I'm going to jump to the second uh, example. And this one has to do with air pollution exposure in preterm births. Uh, and specifically, uh, we're applying penalized vestibular lack nonlinear models to assess the effect of PM2.5 exposure and risk of preterm birth in California's San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and this didn't necessarily start in the same way as the other one. Uh, our background uh, was a little different. We didn't start with the causal question interesting mind, but rather we started with the way that environmental epidemiology deals with uh, prolonged exposures. Uh, so in this case, we have exposures in utero that are occurring for the duration of the pregnancy. Uh, and then we're particularly interested in some outcomes that are happening at birth. Uh, how do we deal with the fact that you're exposed for the duration of the pregnancy, but not necessarily all the exposures uh, are worth the same during the pregnancy? Typically, most studies use either an average over the duration of the pregnancy, or they take separate averages for specific trimesters. Both of these approaches are problematic. Uh, and reasons are because they're assuming a constant lag response. So we're assuming that uh, the exposure during your first week has the same weight as your exposure in week 25 or 32 or 12. Um, it doesn't account for the fact that we have a lot of variability on the exposures during pregnancy. Uh, and also, the duration of exposure is not taken into account. So if you have different cumulative exposures, that's not taken into account. Uh, if we're looking at typical outcomes at birth, so the duration is fixed within two or three weeks. But because this example is preterm birth, the duration is not fixed. So that has to also be taken into account. Uh, and also trimester averages are a little more flexible than pregnancy average, but they still, uh, first of all, there is potential for biases if one specific trimester is of, uh, truly uh, the exposure uh, that matters, but all three trimester exposures are correlated, and for environmental exposures, they usually are. Uh, but also, we're still assuming this constant light response within a trimester. So your exposure at week one is the same as week seven, eight, all the way to week three. Uh, and just to like highlight what that varying intensity of exposure uh, can mean is, this is a random study participant from the study that I'm about to talk about. And you see there's a lot of variation in exposure. You see in those first few weeks, you have exposure to exceeding 35, close to 40 micrograms uh, meter cubed. And then towards the, the latter part of the pregnancy, you are at 10 to 15. So the latter part of the pregnancy is in compliance with the standards. The first few weeks are not. But let's assume that the average duration of pregnancy for this particular person is going to be somewhere around 15 to in the high teens. 
uh, we're going to take this participant that had exposures in the 30s and 40s, and we're basically saying that they count the same as a participant that had exposure around 15 for the duration of their pregnancy. So we're making that very, very strong assumption that the variability in exposure doesn't matter once we come to the, to the average estimates. Uh, so we wanted to take a more flexible approach to actually uh, deal with that variability, uh, deal with the differences in duration and cumulative exposure. And one approach that allows us to do that are the studio live models. And they're fairly well known in environmental IP. It's been used in time series studies for probably 20 years now or more. Um, the issue here is that we're not dealing with a time series study. It's a preterm birth outcome. It's a survival outcome, so there's an atom level of complexity. We're going to have to do it in some kind of uh, survival uh, um, analysis approach. Um, and there have been some examples of uh, using this particular approach in a survival framework. And I'm studying two papers there. They both use Cox models with a distributed analysis uh, for the exposure inside it. And this is the, the main findings from the first of those studies. So the upper left corner shows the effect of PM2.5. Those are weak specific hazard ratios for a given incremental increase. Uh, they're assuming a linear exposure response. So it's, I think it's 10 micrograms to be in a QB increase. So you see a null slightly protective association for the first weeks. And then you have that peak around week, between weeks 20 and uh, 25, 26. Uh, and then they've done other pollutants as well in that study, but we're only focusing on 20 point five. Uh, so same from that second paper I cited. Uh, again, weekly uh, specific hazard ratios for, uh, again, a 10 uh, microgram increase. Uh, and they also see this pattern of null to protective for the first few weeks, and then a jump at around week 18. Uh, and again, another little jump towards the end. So both of these studies tend to show us that there might be some variability uh, in the effect of exposure, depending on the timing of the exposure during pregnancy. Uh, what we did was like take it a step further and we used distributed nonlinear line models. <coughs> uh, and this allows for nonlinearities in the exposure response as well as the lag response. So as well as varying the lag response, like uh, those two studies did, we're also going to allow for the exposure to not to be nonlinear. Uh, and um, I'm citing a few uh, papers about um, applications of these uh, uh, approaches, uh, including a penalized framework where it allows you to use penalized spines to uh, model the exposure response uh, and light response. And we're going to apply that to a data set consisting of all light births from the four most populous counties in San Joaquin Valley in California for uh, all life births between 2000 and 2006. So seven years worth of birth. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with where the San Joaquin Valley is, uh, that's the one in the gray outline within California. Uh, and the black dots represent uh, major cities. So that's San Diego, that's LA, that's San Jose, that's San Francisco, that's Sacramento. Uh, these are the four most populous counties. And this is the city of Fresno, and the city of Bakersfield is somewhere down here. Uh, so Fresno and Bakersfield are part of our uh, study sample, uh, which amounted to about a quarter million births, of which uh, about 12% were preterm. So that's a really high rate of preterm birth. I think in Colorado, the, the estimate is definitely less than 10%, but uh, substantially less than 12. Uh, and the reason why, one of the hypotheses is about air pollution, because this is one of the worst uh, air pollution areas in the country. And um, it has to do with uh, agricultural sources within the area, but also the fact that they're surrounded by the Sierra here on the east and also smaller coastal ranges on the west. So it creates an inversion layer. There's a lot of air pollution that gets trapped in the valley. And again, most of the pollution that's generated over here actually ends up here as well. Uh, so we end up with the, some exposures that are as high as 40 and 50 that I showed in that uh, random example earlier. Um, so we ran our distributed lag model, and this is what we got. So this is a 
3D way of visualizing the exposure lacking spots. And it's very, very hard to actually tell what's going on. So I'm going to try and break it down. Uh, so we're going to take a cross section of this at um, the so that, that line corresponds to the third quartile of the observed exposure distribution. And the way that the, the figure is presented there, it's using the first quartile, quartile as the reference. So what I'm bringing from the 3D to the 2D uh, dimensional area here is an interquartile inter uh, range increase of exposure. And this is how uh, our estimates vary by timing uh, of exposure during the station. Uh, so, unlike those other studies that we're seeing the main uh, exposure effect towards the end of the pregnancy, we're actually seeing our biggest estimates here and also at the beginning. Uh, and it goes from statistical significance to non to a couple places of protective. Um, I personally am a little concerned about over um, overfitting, given this shape. I was expecting to get something a little smoother. Uh, so I'm still working a little bit on that. Uh, but if we want to see the exposure response, we we'll basically do the same thing. So if we look at week one, we just look at that part and we bring it to the two-dimensional space, we get this. So this is a pretty good evidence of nonlinearity. We have, uh, again, this is centered at uh, first fault tidal exposure, which was around nine micrograms. Uh, so it's protective as you go down and then uh, detrimental as we go up in exposure. But um, this is a curvilinear rather than linear relationship. So the assumption of linear exposure response that those earlier studies uh, had made is probably not uh, very well suited. Uh, but also another thing to consider is that this is not constant across uh, pregnancy. So if we look at that, uh, one point in time and we take a couple more and we put them on, you see that the shape of the exposure response changes as we look at different times in the pregnancy. Uh, so one, that's a good thing because we're using a method that actually does allow us to do that. Uh, but then the second is then how do we expect, uh, how do we explain this uh, flip in the sign of the effect? So here, if we go from the first quartile down to lower exposures, it appears protective, whereas uh, rather detrimental, rather than we would expect it to be protective, as it is here. So that's another issue that I'm a little concerned about uh, overfitting, and hopefully I, I can uh, smooth it out. Um, so now I'm going to try and bring this. So far, this is just an environmental epi exercise. It's a, an advanced methodology application, but uh, it doesn't have anything to do with causal inference or empirical causality. Um, um, it does help us to um, address issues that could uh, lead to bias and potentially identify influential uh, windows of exposure, but there are limitations in the interpretation uh, of those time-specific estimates. So when this study actually shows uh, weak-specific hazard ratios, each of those hazard ratios is conditional on the exposures of the other weeks. So we're basically going and saying we're going to raise the uh, exposure of week 18 by 10 micrograms, holding everything else constant. And that's never going to happen in real life. So that is a problem with interpretation. That has a ratio may be useful in trying to see if there's like a pattern of windows. But as, a, as an effect estimator, we're going to try to generate a policy or estimate risk is useless because it's never going to happen in real life. Uh, so I went in and tried to do something that might actually happen in real life. Uh, and also there's like the added benefit of not staying with the hazard ratio. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm going to try and report the risk other than anything else. Uh, and there are inherent limitations of the hazard ratio that we avoid by doing that. Uh, again, uh, avoid limitations. It's a uh, risk is a collapsible parameter. The hazard ratio is not rate ratio is not, off ratio is not. Uh, but it's also easier to interpret and more directly relevant for public health. Um, and if you want to know more about this, there's a great commentary <coughs> from uh, 2010 by Miguel Hernan, uh, 
hold the hazards of hazard ratios. I strongly suggest that everyone at the OGS 11 obviously leads that. Um, so I'm going to turn my attention to risk. And this is the observed risk, the cumulative instance from that population of uh, about a quarter million births. So what this is doing is basically counting every birth when it happens. And then we're essentially reaching one when the last child was born. Uh, we had a limit at week 42, so the last uh, child's born at week 42. The red portion is uh, the timing of the pregnancy where that would be considered uh, a preterm birth. Uh, and another point of note is actually that this is limited to Fresno County. So um, it's actually a subset of those uh, 40 million births. Uh, so I took that red portion and blew it up. And this is the cumulative incidence for preterm birth. Uh, and that reaches about 12%, which was the observed that I mentioned. Uh, ideally, what we want is this to be zero. So we want a flat line between weeks one and 37. And then we would want that uh, cumulative instance graph to start going up. Um, so what I did was take the observed exposure. This is a density plot of all the weekly exposures for all the participants in Fresno County. Uh, so the, the median was around 15 to 16, the mean was around 20. Uh, and then you see some pretty high exposures out here in the 40s, 50s, 60s. And I think there's some exposures in the hundreds from some wildfires that happened there. Uh, but the majority of the exposure is between this zero and 20 um, range. What I did was take these exposures and randomly reduce them by a tiny bit. And if it was a really high exposure, it would be reduced by a little more. It was a small exposure, it would be reduced by uh, a small proportion. So I came up with a counterfactual exposure distribution that looked like that. So quite similar, it's a little shifted to the left, so closer to zero. And the overall difference in the mean was about three micrograms. So it dropped from about 20 to about 17 micrograms. Uh, and then I used that model, prediction model from before, but this time only for Fresno County. And I generated risk uh, using this counterfactual kind of exposure. So this was the observed risk. And under that counterfactual kind of exposure, that's the counterfactual kind of risk. So they look quite close to each other. But if you look towards the end, that gap right here, that's a pretty sizable gap of almost 2%. So that drops our cumulative incidence from 12% to about 95 uh, so even that tiny, tiny shift in exposure that just shifted about a few micrograms to, uh, to closer to zero resulted in two and a half percent drop in risk. So in Fresno, that would have been um, about 2,000 preterm, preterm births for that year, for that seven year duration. Uh, I also have to say that for Fresno, the effect estimates were quite higher than the ones that I showed. So I'm working on doing this for the entire uh, study sample, so all four counties. And I'm expecting to see a much smaller drop. Uh, I'm not sure why. The exposures tend to be quite similar, but Fresno tends to be worse than the other places as well. So uh, that could factor in. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up with some of my current projects uh, and some future steps that I want to do. Um, my R00 that's ongoing uh, to do with air pollution and children's respiratory and metabolic outcomes, also in Fresno, California. Uh, we're looking at uh, some potential mediators, some uh, inflammatory pathways, uh, and trying to apply a causal mediation approach. It's uh, actually quite similar to the time-bearing confounding example that I just showed, uh, except that for a time value confounder, you have a meaning of interest. Um, I'm involved in an NSF grant about causal has, uh, coastal hazards in human health. And in particular, we have a case study of uh, potential water contamination and birth outcomes. Um, and also through my post FBI, I'm also involved in some further uh, occupational ID uh, projects, uh, particularly looking at diesel exhaust exposures, 
and COPD mortality in minors. And I should also mention that the Alpha Foundation was the funder for the silica study that I pre presented. And some stuff that are in the works, uh, I'm trying to put together um, a birth outcomes cohort with information on censoring. So anything uh, on pregnancy loss, including stillbirth and uh, spontaneous abortion that could help us truly uh, treat uh, birth as a, or preterm birth as a survival outcome. Similar to the example that I showed you with Lancaster and Normal US fertility disease, uh, where we're uh, uh, basically uh, treating those two as competing against each other. If we have information on stillbirth or pregnancy loss, that could be informative of any birth outcome we have. And we can work in that sub-distribution uh, paradigm for survival analysis um, and deal with issues of sensory tractation and production. Uh, and also, I'm trying to put together um, a project through the ECHO OIF uh, funding mechanism through the center, the award center here, about transportability of effectiveness from one population to another. Uh, so we're hoping that gets funded and I'll have to start spending more time down here. Uh, and through that, I'm gonna pass through my references and say thank you. And I wanna put in a plugin that we're looking for doctoral students and or postdocs. So if anyone's interested, uh, you can go online and check or contact me directly. Thank you.